Hello, thanks. So yes, today I'm going to talk about uh, connectivity, how we use connectivity models for spatial prioritization, and how we use that for cost, to improve cost control efforts. So, okay, let's see. Uh, so I'm broadly going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you some general background on, on how we actually model connectivity in this setting. Then I'm going to talk about how we operationalize the uh, connectivity models, and then I'm going to talk about some of the advanced, more advanced uh, approaches and some future approaches that come from, from that. So when we talk about modeling connectivity first, what we're trying to do is we're trying to model source sync relationships between reefs, where the, what is, which reef is source, which reef is sync is de determined by a lot of different factors that is, affect dispersal which we hopefully get from, uh, from field studies and experimental studies. And so we want to we model, but what we want to model is not just individual source sync uh, relationships, but we want to do it actually at the wider scale. So we know where more larvae go, where less larvae go, what happens after that, are there some feedbacks? And so when we try to model this uh, from a lot of reefs, uh, not just a single reef, we get a regional connectivity network. So to do the, the space, to model the actual dispersal, we need we use oceanographic models, and here is, is an example of one. So for my work, I've mostly used e reefs. So you can see here those little arrows that move around. That's actually the forces that move the uh, the particles uh, that you release from this red dot, and they get moved around, and then they move to other reefs. And this is how we actually. So this is this is what simulates the dispersal. Uh, by um, hydrodynamic forces, and when we we can then, this is a fairly crude animation of how this works when you actually release particles from uh, different reefs. So particles go, some particles get lost either by uh, you know by hitting land, but other particles go to other reefs, and then we can see where those connections between reefs are. And so when we have when we know where the reefs uh, are located. Uh, we can then use the dispersal simulations by imbuing uh, some characteristics of the lava particles, like how long do they stay in the water, uh, we, and we have the forces that move the larvae, and then we can use that to create uh, a, a connectivity network. So here uh, we start with coral connectivity network because coral connectivity, we are trying to actually maximize coral resilience. Uh, so, but we can use the same principle. We just change the characteristics of the lava particles, and we also have then a cross connectivity network. So this is the basics of how this works. We can use different hydrodynamic models, but you know, it's all these principles what I've been what I've been talking up to now, and what I've been talking uh, uh, will apply uh, regardless of which uh, hydrodynamic model you use. So, okay. So once we have the connectivity network, uh, what do we do with it? How do you? How would we operationalize it? Uh, well, usually when you talk about we want to find a uh, coral connectivity. We want to find uh, reefs that are good, going to be good sources of coral larvae. So what does that mean? It means that they have high replenishment potential. So they can uh, supply a lot of reefs, a lot of larvae to a lot of reefs. And we hope that those reefs are also going to be sources. So this is this is going to be like a recovery cascade. That, 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 so they're going to support the resilience at the regional level. We want the reefs to, to do this consistently because connectivity changes between seasons. We want to do reefs that can do this for multiple species because we have multiple species that are reef builders. And we want to have reefs that have healthy adult stocks. And so that's one of the things that um, connectivity modeling alone can't tell you. But what, we're try what we can do is try to find the reefs that have either high currently observed coral cover or in, maybe do some indirect uh, inference from like low exposure to disturbances, or we can use predictions from the ecosystem models, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Okay, so that's when we want to talk about coral. And when we talk about cots, we want to find the co when uh, we want to find, when we talk, talk about uh, operationalizing connectivity models for cots, we want to find reefs that are going to have uh, be at high risk of uh, outbreak or exposure to cots larvae. So they're going to be good sinks versus poor sinks. Um, so, and also we want to find the reefs that are going to be, have the potential to propagate this uh, uh, outbreak to other reefs. So we have good sources and we have poor sources and good sources can be a then, uh, you know, they can uh, create this whole cascade of outbreaks. And so these would be our super spreader reefs. And so once we, we actually have these categories, we can then try to do some initial prioritization of uh, how we could target effort um, across the reefs uh, that we've identified. 
And so, but what, when we actually operationalizing this, we don't want to just say, uh, well, our model says this, we want to try to validate this. Uh, and so the connectivity models are notoriously difficult to validate, but we're fortunate with quotes that we have, we can do something that you can't really do readily with things like Coral. Uh, so we, we have, we can, so we can use the connectivity, historical connectivity predictions by saying which reefs were likely to, to receive a lot of COTS lobby. And then we can look at the field data to see where the, where the, which reefs actually had adult COTS after that period, after that prediction period, and see whether the model predictions actually match what we find in reefs in uh, some, uh, so later. And so to just formalize this a little bit, so we want to test whether the supply of COTS lobby leads to outbreaks, the predicted supply of COTS lobby, uh, so, which means that more larvae uh, predicted in an earlier period leads to more adult cuts in a later period. And we, we, when we did this uh, for the uh, data that were available for, from the FMP, from the field management program, we found that the connectivity models actually predict, uh, uh, connectivity model predictions actually match what we find in cut surveys. So we can, uh, it's, we can probably, probably the best way to use this is to actually then categorize reefs into something like um, low risk versus high risk. And we see that the models so far predict are much better at predicting which reefs are not going to get outbreaks rather than which reefs are going to get outbreaks, which is good. As Cameron said, we want to have a, a low um, level of false negatives because we don't want to miss reefs that actually have cuts. And if you go to some reefs that uh, will predict it to have cuts but actually don't have cuts, that's a bit of a um, that's less uh, damage, I would guess. Um, and so, and the importance of identifying low risk reefs is for identifying, uh, so where not to expend resources when if you're looking at new region or if we're talking about the new outbreak. Uh, so there's definitely operationalized, uh, operational um, advantages of knowing which reefs are not going to have outbreaks. And so this is, uh, and inferring level export so we can use the validation of import. So if, it, if import works, then we uh, can infer that export also works for, for the models. Um, so which, because export is actually much harder to validate. Um, well, you know, some of the genetic um, uh, techniques might actually help with that. Okay, so once we actually have that for both codes and coral, then we can actually combine these uh, uh, predictions so we can have um, different categories, and we can we can we can then propose different actions. So, for example, we might say what we care most of are the good coral coral sources. We don't care about cod so much. So, these are the sources. These are the reefs that we want to protect, and we want to enforce protection on those. Then we can say which reefs are going to be uh, coral sources, but they are also at high risk of cods, and these are the reefs that we want to monitor and then protect and call if they actually do have cods. Then we can actually talk about cod sources, just sub super spreaders. So we don't care about corals, but yes, these reefs are going to make regional situation worse. This is where we go and call, but maybe not the first. It's not the, maybe not the first choice. And then we have other reefs, so for example, that we can continue to evaluate to see, you know, if we care about this particular reef. Uh, for example, and so we can play around with these categories. And so what we put out as an output is um, our regional prioritization in space. So, uh, and so we have these priority categories that are, we hope it's going to be simple and common sense set of rules. So we have like four categories more and they're, they're going to be easy to explain. So people want to use them. And so this is what we've been providing to burn plant control program so far. And it's now part of the regional decision support tool that it has been implemented. And it's also integrated with other criteria. So it's not just connectivity, but also, and as well as other frameworks that Cameron has already been talking about. Okay, so that's how, what, where we are now. And so a little bit about what, where this is all heading. So uh, talk about dynamic regional prioritization. So as I said, connectivity can only get you so far because we don't know what, what, how much pots and how much coral is on those reefs. So to do that, uh, we're currently using uh, ecosystem models and the model that I'm using, uh, that I'm relying on mostly uh, right now is the model developed at UQ called ReefMon. It's uh, a coral um, ecosystem model of uh, coral dynamics. And so I'm not going to talk about uh, reef mode in much detail. I'm just going to say that models individual colonies in space. It models, uh, you know, the growth, the mortality. So, um, and, and from that, it extrapolates the coral cover. But each individual colony of about six types of coral is actually modeled. And we combine this with a COTS meta population model. So we actually have uh, COTS that eat those colonies. 
uh, in the reef. And of course, uh, that's a pretty complex uh, population model, but uh, and where connectivity is only a small part of it that actually gives this, this meta population dimension of that. So you can imagine if we have a set of reefs and each of these reefs is modeled as uh, one uh, one in uh, one is one um, well in version of reef mod. Uh, so we have connectivity that can then lick it up into a regional dynamics. So into actually meta community uh, of corals where we can model the effects of disturbances. So if disturbance hits particular reefs, we can then see what's going to be effect not on, only on those reefs but also on recovery on other reefs. For example, reefs downstream. Uh, and so once we add codes to that, so we usually with codes we have incomplete information, and so we can use these sorts of models to say, uh, to try to infer where codes are at the moment, given their connectivity and where we where could we find them. Um, so we can compensate for incomplete information. And this is helpful for both prioritization of control, but also prioritization for monitoring. So we can say, okay, we really need to know what's on this reef maybe we should go and check those out. So we need to, this, this sort of setup tells us what we need to know, where, when do we need to know it and where do we need to go. Okay, and so what do we do? So we can actually uh, allocate the management resources uh, uh, regionally in different ways. So we have, so historically we tried out a couple of approaches. I'm just gonna give you some examples of how, how you can do this uh, in different ways. So, for example, one of the strategies were, that have, we have been testing is you. Um, so, uh, control is just always going to go to reefs that have the most cuts on them, and so we're go going to ignore connectivity and we're going to just attack the biggest outbreaks because this is sort of like what what has been done historically. So, we go to, to the reefs that have most cuts, we call them, we see reef cuts spawn, and then we see how much cuts and how much coral we have uh, in the future. And we can also do another strategy where, to, to, where we actually call the codes as sources, so it's connectivity based. So we don't go where the codes are, uh, where the codes are most abundant, but where the codes are most likely going to spread. And if we do that, we can then uh, see what what do we get after that. And so that means that we can design, uh, and then we can compare these strategies. So we can design multiple strategies, multiple uh, decision frameworks that uh, allocate resources uh, regionally. Um, we can compare the outcomes and then figure out which one is best that will and then use that to inform decision making and which one is best uh, can be done we can we can do that using multiple criteria or multiple measures of effectiveness so for example we can compare strategies performance against different uh, uh, objectives so we can do that to look at we can look at you know uh, what kind of distribution of benefits we get for different strategies but we can also do it a bit more simply say which reefs which um, strategy gives us the best coral cover after a while? So, and we and we want to try to find simple rules so that it's nothing too arcane, too complicated. Uh, the strategy of how we should prioritize reefs regionally. We can look at multiple criteria. So we can say, well, we don't want to just maximize coral. We want to also kill a lot of cuts. So we can uh, do the trade-offs and uh, try to uh, reconcile the competing objectives and then to find a winner. Uh, a best strategy that is going to be optimized to achieve multiple objectives. Okay, so instead of having a static um, a prioritization strategy, we can then, uh, the idea is then to move to something a bit more dynamic. So if we have reefs like, um, so um, uh, a set of reefs uh, in the region, instead of just saying which reefs are priority, we can, uh, and then go with the fixed list, we can do update this dynamically based on where we, where as the new information comes online and new information can be from the current uh, vessel voyages. And so what we really wanna do is actually to be able to plan, dynamically plan routes so that local uh, uh, route planning, so that uh, local actions uh, have the maximum uh, systemic benefits uh, after they're implemented. So we're actually we can and we and we want this kind of strategies to be, be adaptive to be able to incorporate new information, and so and we also want because you, the route planning is not just a simple um, uh, application of effort. So we want to account for things like vessel time, uh, travel distance, uh, distance to the port, and so in, and combine that with the benefits to find, again get to like optimized solution, but we also again want it to be simple, common sense and relatable. So we don't want this to be arcane, but, uh, but you know, that it needs to run the whole model, but something that can actually be easily um, uh, uh, interpreted. And so, and this is going to this, we've done some of this work 
uh, up to now, but also this is planned to be uh, a big part of the advanced uh, regional decision support tool that will hopefully be part of the CSIP in the future. Thank you very much for that. And yes, I would like to thank a lot of uh, people uh, that have been um, part of this work of the, of the years. Thanks.